world doing things. <laughs> so that entropy is out there in the world doing things. I would claim the same, of course, also for the centimeter and other abstract notions. But we don't really, we can't, so we can't semantically really say uh, and define what it is, but it is interesting to study what it does. Yeah. So the point of view that I would like to foreground with um, this, this, uh, this, this interest in, in translation um, picks up what I would call a philosophical notion of translation, so not a technological one. So how to, or to put it differently, perhaps what I, what is, what, what kind of resulted for me for, from my work, which went very, very far into technical, precise differentiations and lines of arguments uh, uh, while I was working on my book on Michel Serre and to understand how his quite literary style of writing really has a precision in thinking which I admire greatly and which I find very uh, rarely recognized and acknowledged and, and, and or even celebrated. So that was a, a really a, a big part of why I wanted to write on Michel Serre. And what kind of stayed with me more and more perhaps even is, is this, this um, an idea how this, this, this focus on code, because that's at the core uh, in my approach, at least, to, um, to think about um, entropy, mainly in its relation to its background in physics, thermodynamics and energy and heat, and negative entropy in its uh, context of information theory, but bordering or verging, of course, with uh, life or a science of life, even as, as uh, some people say. So what, what is, what is uh, facilitating these processes, these con conversions, we could say, or convertings, really is an understanding of um, translation, which poses us the challenge to think as an a priori to um, a writing that would not be translation. No? So this question of the original text, which somehow needs to be conveyed into another language, I think is uh, in many ways analog to an understanding uh, of, of uh, communication processes facilitated by, by uh, information theory, uh, which also uh, um, kind of places the communication as an, as an act between a sender and a receiver that, is, that, can be, that can be facilitated, that can be, um, yeah, conveyed, technically, technically fa yeah, facilitated. But the way, at least in which, um, not only Michel Serre, but more and more people I find, also earlier people, so Charles Peirce, for example, in his semiotics is, is, uh, is concerned with a continuity between mind and matter. No? So uh, continuity um, where, where he said, okay, we, we, we can think of, of a, of mind as very fast matter and matter as very slow mind. No? So, so there is a kind of a strange spectrality, let's say, that links the two or the, the, these poles. And in a similar understanding, um, Ser, Michel Serre generalizes uh, um, his understanding of communication to nature at large. No? So it, it crystallizes in this, in this uh, very radical idea um, but also in a way very precise idea that everything we know, everything that exists on any scale, whether a sun or a galaxy or a drop of water or a person, um, communicates in the sense that uh, all of these things send, receive, store, and somehow deal with information. And this on many scales at once. So on many, on many scales at once, not in a linear process that would somehow take part apart from our being alive or being here or there, but um, completely integrated to that. So an understanding of translation where code is constitutive, but code plays a bit the role of currency. So it's a general equivalent code. And there's a plurality of codes. Yeah, perhaps even an indefinite one. So I will come back to this, but this is the reason why I, I like to speak of a quantum literacy or a coding literacy. But a coding literacy is, uh, that's for me very important, is not um, an epistemological proficiency in formalism or formalist thinking. It, it, it is, it is I'm, I'm committed to a materialism with regard to this. 
So there is one philosopher whom I like very much because there is a kind of a, yeah, a sobriety about her approach with respect to the question of symbols and symbolism that um, was so explosive, we could say, in the early 20th century around the so-called foundational wars where mathematics and, and logics basically were competing for, um, um, yeah, let's say a position of authority with respect to knowledge. She was, um, she was, she was um, doing her PhD with, with two mathematicians, two very strong mathematicians and, and philosophers with uh, Whitehead and with Kassirer, um, always, but always on the, on the border, on the, on the verge of more anthropological entailments of these questions than epistemological entailments primarily. I would say. Also, this gives an emphasis, which, um, of course, um, puts certain aspects very much to the background, but it, it's the one which I want to, to pick up here. And she wrote this book very early, which is entitled uh, Philosophy in a New Key. We can perhaps quickly look at how she means this. So philosophy in a new key. She begins by saying that the new key in philosophy is not one which I have struck. And it's important. So it's a notion of key which has little to do with authorship in the sense of somebody proposing an argument and entering a debate. She says this new key is not one which she has struck. Other people have struck it quite clearly and repeatedly. This book purports merely to demonstrate the unrecognized fact that it is a new key and to show how the main themes of our thoughts tend to be transposed into it. As every shift of tonality gives a new sense to previous passages, so the reorientation of philosophy which is taking place in our age bestows new aspects on the ideas and arguments of the past. Our thinking stems from that past, but does not continue it in the ways that were foreseen. This is a motif, I would say, which um, underlies the whole book. Um, she picks it up uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a very, uh, I would say direct, but of course um, imaginative way, um, by kind of linking the interests in epistemology to an interest in a kind of an agriculture, no? a kind of a cultivation of, um, of, of symbolic, of, 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 yeah, of how <laughs> centimeters out there do stuff, yeah? <laughs> of how symbols and symbolisms um, that 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 are in 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 circulation that 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 are granted recognition how they um, impact um, things that go on. So <clears throat> the focus that she shifts with this issue on the new key is to say um, let's 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 um, shift focus from trying to determine. A definition like a semantic, a precise vocabulary of semantically, uh, uh, yeah, objective terms. Let's shift interest rather from from doing that to studying how we handle things. And she she says that her, her starting point. Every age in the history of philosophy has its own preoccupation. Its problems are peculiar to it, not for obvious practical reasons, political or social, but for deeper reasons of intellectual growth. So here it becomes clear that this, this perspective that she opens up with um, kind of a, let's say, culture <laughs> approach to knowledge, so a cultivation approach, even a, a kind of, no, I, I, as much gardening as farming, at least. But there is an ethical dimension to that as well. She calls it reasons of intellectual growth. And... <clears throat> This theme, this motif, I don't want to get rid of it as quickly as many people do today, but it is of course a very tricky and a very difficult one of how to, how to pick it up no? or how to relate to it. So what I titled in my, in my title, um, how did I call it? Architectonic involution. No? So the activism as a kind of an activism. This activism has something to do with um, in a way, infolding a kind of an activism that would unfold in, in territories, that would, that would go out into the world and mobilize and reorganize maps and territories and, and uh, yeah, let's say, power structures and kind of um, interiorize 
No? But in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a similar way, uh, differentiated. So it's, a, it's a quite an old notion of um, what, what in German we would call Bildung as well. No? Even in English, there is this saying of um, that knowledge also has something to do with edification. So there is a whole legacy of architectonic thinking that does not strictly mean the thinking that pertains to built architecture or to sketched architecture, but architectonic thinking very much in, 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 in such an understanding of a, public, of a public education. So this is what I'm quite committed to these days, at least, <laughs> these years. And um, it is in the background of what I would like to talk about. The way to access from such a point of view, and this I find striking, is uh, the question of technique, the treatment that the problem begins with, uh, is always uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a question. It's in a kind of a question. And this, I find, is something that we, uh, especially through this emphasis on, on a combination between history of ideas, history of science, and then, and then an epistemology, which is often fused and combined with a history of, of these, of these uh, yeah, achievements or growth or, or, or developments or however one wants to call them. Um, we have lots to ask questions, no? So, so, so our main emphasis is uh, target oriented. It, there's always problems to be solved. There's always problems that give us the criteria to go to, to propose certain genealogies, to propose the reorganization of certain fields of uh, of expertise and so on. But there's something about learning how to ask a question in the first place, which uh, for me links to what she addresses with uh, something like an intellectual uh, growth. So the notion of the key in her in her approach to me is also so so striking. Of course, on the one hand, because it's um, uh, it relates uh, evidently to things like codes, codes, notations, <coughs> um, also partitions, um, because it's it's a, it's a notion from mu from music here. So it's and in music, uh, you know, ultimately the partitions are uh, partitions of a, of, a, of a circle. Yeah, so something circuitous, not something um, elemental like in geometry or linear, like in like in analysis, and in calculus. So something circular and something where many 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 layers can also coexist. So there are there is a depth to to uh, to that kind of um, space, let's say, which is um, which has very different qualities than Cartesian our notion of Cartesian um, analytical space. And it is in such a space that 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 her uh, approach to to knowledge um, and to and to uh, insight is located. So <clears throat> the scales. Um, this was something that I didn't really elaborate in my book on Ser, and I still did not do it yet. But it gets more and more, I think, convincing for me that this notion of scales. Um, which we, which we in a constructive kind of thinking uh, very quickly associate with dimensions, no? with, with a kind of, an, even if it's an, in a formal, formal space of, of, of many dimensions or n dimensions, but scale, we kind of link it to a spatial notion um, of, a, of a coordinate, ultimately of a coordinated space, no? even if it's a topological rendering of a coordinated space. Otherwise, we couldn't do analysis with it. And um, what, what, what I find very intriguing more and more is to learn to think again of, of scales in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that pertains to harmonics in this sense. So harmonics in the sense of music, in the sense of sound, not in the sense of um, uh, a good way to uh, orchestrate um, the establishment of harmony or something like that. So not as a moral term, but in its, in its mathematical sense uh, uh, from harmonics. And then we are in a very different domain because we are in time, but it's not really a time that could be very, let's say, productively described through um, processes of production. No? So, so it, it's not really, with, with regard to sound and music, it's not really about the message that will last. No, It's about an experience that lasts. And it's about um, an, a, a complexity and a... And a um, Multi, multi-scalar <laughs> kind of experience. So this I would I would like to, <clears throat> to give as a kind of a, a motivic key to my talk. My approach to entropy and its translation wants to focus on the passing of time. Yeah? So not history, 
not the present, not representation, but the passing of time very much in such a sense that um, that, that, that happens, like, like, like these um, musical scales that we find in uh, Susan Langer's <clears throat> approach. What I, what I have here is a, is a short excerpt from a text that Michel Serre wrote quite late and to which you actually pointed me, Lillian. I'm very happy you did. Um, on Virginia Woolf's novel To the Lighthouse. What he says here is, he observes time passes and then there is this striking sentence to measure the passage of time. She needed a clock. She used the house as a clock. I would like to look more at the, at the context of this um, with a larger excerpt. So the, the article by Serre is entitled Feu et signaux de brume, yeah? also fires and, and signals or signs um, that are noisy and that uh, uh, brume is noise, noisy, yeah? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I think so. On which in to the lighthouse. So the first title is Time Passes, Lost Time, Duration. Part of this, uh, let's say, a positivist um, interest that I have has precisely to do with this. There can be time lost in an objective sense, no? not in a subjective. So I lose time all the time, of course, but time can be lost in a way that is not subject centric in, in, the, same, in the same fashion. So this to me is very, very interesting. But how does he mean it? No? He begins to, 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 to write, so to compare, to kind of place Virginia Woolf in a setup or in a constellation against uh, Marcel Proust, um, we will see why and how. His argument is that um, the text by Virginia Woolf is uh, thinking in the open. It's thinking in the weather, it's thinking exposed to nature, whereas um, Proust's writing is very much uh, uh, unfolding within the intimacy of an apartment, of an interior, no? of, a, of a domestic space. Uh, that that is and remains quite um, inward inward cent inward inward um, centric, and this interest that I have in 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 uh, architectonic um, involution with this edifying, it has to do with this can only happen if one is exposed. So that's part of why the text by Virginia Woolf is so interesting to me. So he writes. <clears throat> she entitled the second part of her novel Time Passes. To measure the passage of time, she needed a clock. She used a house. The way an abandoned country house grows old is something everyone has seen and understands. Little airs pry their way in. Water leaks through widening cracks. Rats invade. Spiders stubbornly weave their webs. Dust thickens on floorboards, beginning to shrink apart, until that brief moment when the balance is tipped by something as light as a feather. The roof caves in and the house suddenly collapses and so on. He begins to differentiate how we can think of time in a way that is not directly the tenses that we know in grammar. Also, it's important to realize that these are actually quite different between the different languages. So it's not at all clear what tenses are in grammar. But he doesn't reduce it to that, but opens up a kind of a philological approach with it by singling out um, a relation that time has in many languages with the weather. And then there again comes a sentence which is uh, very strong. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> so the first of these times, so between um, uh, time and, and weather, the first is chaotic. It is registered on a barometer. And the second is oscillating on a chronometer. Time and weather, Zeit und Wetter. So chronometer and, and barometer, no? Of course we could say simply no category mistakes, um, yes. And yet. It's interesting to see and to think about how the two relate. Um, he gets more, let's say, translating <clears throat> to the kind of discourses he is talking to with this text, because I very much um, am convinced that when Serre writes texts like this, he is talking to all the scientists of his age. So that's another aspect that I want to come back to. So this translating entropy for me, um, uh, is related to a, to a coding literacy, to a quantum literacy, which, which, uh, which, which manifests itself in a kind of a literary reason. No, not, not precisely scientific reason, not precise, precisely cultural reason, but all of it uh, on, a, on, on grounds which are abundant. So we will see how, how, how I mean that. 
All the languages that I know, he writes, softly assimilate three times, which hard science as well as individual subjective consciousness differentiate. One, reversible and regular, turns continuously with the lamp of the lighthouse. But there are also two others. The first, negative, irregular and irreversible, is visible in erosion and wear, sickness, death and dying. So in this kind of, of, um, of, of constellation between, between physics and, and uh, 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 thermodynamics, energy flows, um, uh, statistic, statistical um, uh, uh, predictions and so on, on the one hand, and then the phenomena of life and its quantification on the other hand, there includes death on the same level. And this is uh, part of what I mean is so crucial about his approach. So it's not a formalism and it's not a metaphysics directly in any sense that we know it. But it's, it's I would say, quite mechanical in the old sense of the word. So it's a mechanical, there always must be not so much a, a mirror where you could have the symmetries, but a, a kind of a fulcrum. No? So, so if there is life, we must include death. Death is not just a side effect to it. Death, we, can, we can't treat life without kind of um, making the full circle. We can't just look at one pole. Of, of, these, of these things. So what does death then qualify or add to um, how time passes, no? if we are interested in, 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 in time, in, in translating entropy with respect to the passing of time? No? <clears throat> and then there is another such strong sentence where he writes, Situated, so this is now the site of the, of, the, of the story, is situated off the coast of Scotland, not far from a port in the Hebrides, close to the sea and battered by semi-constant rain and winds, the universal clock house marks the superabundant multiplicity of these durations. With these durations, he means precisely everything that happens um, in, the, in, the, in the site and in the story. And if you know the plot, what is so peculiar about this, it is uh, almost nothing happens. <laughs> almost nothing happens, except an enormous, an enormous play of shifting attentions, but also um, a concentration of these attentions. And the passing of time has something to do with this kind of attention. And that's again how I would like to link it back to this uh, context that um, Langer also opened up. There is something like uh, intellectual growth as well. So, <clears throat> It is in this sense that um, there is a, I find a, a strong interest, not so much in now in, in, in specialized and specific or, or integral uh, kind of disciplines like new disciplines like, like, uh, like ecology or so, but just quite plain and simply natural philosophy. Because in natural philosophy, so in, in a pre-modern sense, there was an alliance between, there was not really a notion of space organizing things. There was an alliance between the weather and the study of the weather and notions of place. And they have both had to do with the role of bodies. So there were um, natural bodies um, in, in, uh, in pre-modern uh, philosophy. And these natural bodies, they were distributed bodies throughout the whole world. So the elements, fire, water, earth, and air, they were called bodies. And every species body is made up of them, but in different ways. So, so <clears throat> this is a kind of a, of a thick thinking that um, resonates uh, interestingly, I find, with this approach of which, of which uh, Langer speaks. No, that certain concepts they get. So her, her argument is that concepts or ideas, they can be exhausted in certain times. They're no longer productive. They're no longer fertile. But at the same time, ideas which had been uh, uh, preoccupying people or, or the, the way of dealing with things a lot in earlier time become uh, uh, strangely productive again because they, they acquire a new kind of, um, a new kind of, of scope. That, that they facilitate. So they give, they bring in a kind of an optics which is which is um, sim which includes symbolical shifts that help to get distance to 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 this uh, to this worn out um, habits of thinking, let's say, that characterize a time in in such a in such a situation when a new key is being struck. So this um, is of course a metaphoric way of referring it, but you can also picture it quite directly. No? So what they meant with these elements and why they would say these natural bodies are bodies is because they were animated. And in that sense, uh, pertaining to cosmos. Now, cosmos is not just the world, it's, it's, it's the assumption that the, the world is 
a whole and that this whole is of a strange um, way and in many different ways um, animated. So wh what brought them to think like this are, are um, processes of course, of the transformation of the elements, but then also especially the scale changes. So when 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 uh, when rain uh, when rain uh, uh, freezes, for example, or where um, <clears throat> the yeah when the elements undergo transformations into 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 the into each other. I don't want to go into this very deeply, um, but it's it's in the background of these questions on on which. I have been working a lot. So translation as a philosophical, not as a technological one, then an idea of quantum literacy, and then such an understanding, which in a way treats its object positive, but cryptic. No? So this is not a contradiction. If we, if we adopt the point of view of code, code as being something uh, different from linguistics or from um, algebraic symbols or from any other specific kind of alphabet, but code, as code, so in its abstractness, like a category as category, no, not always a category which works as a class, a category which works as a criterion or as a worldview, but a category as a category. So to work with this with this self-referential um, relation and study and figure out how it works like that. The same thing with. Um, Um, it looks like there's a problem with the connection. Do other people have the problem as well? I can't hear Vera anymore. Yeah, yeah, I've got the problem as well, yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, I guess we'll just uh, maybe wait briefly. Ah, oh, Vera, you're back. We lost you for a second. Now, I, now it should work. Is it fine now? Yes, good. Sorry, apologies. So among these notions that help to stabilize this constellation, a quantum literacy in terms of ethics and natural philosophy would be things like, on the one hand, canon as well, scale, then a motif, much more than patterns, canon in relation to bodies. So, so I, I want to, to suggest that there is a kind of a, an abstract notion of a body of thinking um, resulting from if, if we really if we really take uh, the translation of, of entropy, um, yeah, if you're not afraid of taking it far, <laughs> um, and something like literary reason, yeah. So then, <clears throat> I want to show you just briefly what without going because it gets too technical. But what I was interested in with this notion of a quantum literacy. Mm, it has to do, of course, with the agency uh, at stake. No? So a, a, a literacy has a lot to do with rhetoric. So there is a large part of mechanics at, at stake. And mechanics is, as we know, no, objective and yet biased. <laughs> yeah? So we can't make a mechanism work as a mechanism, but we can make many things with understanding mechanisms. So there is a, an, an, um, a constellation of subjective of subjectivity and, and, um, and the, in relation to the object or of, of uh, if there is objectivity of a, a crystallization of subjects. And this moment of a crystallization of subject is also what links it in there to an object, he calls it an objective transcendental. So the transcendental is the place where the position of the subject is, 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 uh, is, is constituted by, but the transcendental does not, it, it does not represent the faculties of subjective thinking. No, so the, the transcendental rather um, brings objectives into constellation. And objectives um, 
they're not authored by individuals. So they're, they're, they, they have much more to do with um, these keys that are being struck, uh, of which Langer speaks. So then the question would be how to think of this agency. I mean, the, for quantum literacy, two things are, are, um, are crucial. One is there is an elementary kind of indecision. So, it, so to get out of, of, the, of the affirmative negative or of the dialectic thinking um, <clears throat> in that sense. And it's important to take ignorance into account <clears throat> with quantum literacy. Yeah, so one is never one cannot one cannot be <clears throat> one cannot be safe by by referring to so-called legitimate um, state of the art or something like that. So I think the same problem is there again. Maybe we just wait a second. Ah. Where you were, you were gone for, oh, I think like 20 seconds or something. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about this. No worries at all. Um, it's not your fault. And now. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, true, David. It's the life of an one line. Ah, no. Okay. We can. Is it, is it fine? Now it's fine again. Yeah. Now it's fine again. Okay. Um, this elementary indecision has something to do with, with, um, with the cultivation of this indecision. Very much like so, the indecision is is uh, it, it's uh, in my uh, yeah. I think the the writings of Langer and her idea of the of the uh, new key um, helps to to imagine this 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 materiality of an of an um, yeah of an indecision, which can be which is not about it's not about learning how to decide how to bring decision into the indecision, but how to cultivate it. How to make things grow out of it? No? How to handle it? How to treat it in an exterior kind of way, in a, in, a, in a mechanic kind of way, with industriousness as well. So it's not at all opposed to, to techniques, um, but it is trying to set itself apart from technology. No? So the idea that techniques and logos could be fused systematically. No? It would insist that there is techniques as a practice, and then there is logos as a way to think about that. No? But to resist the systematic uh, fusion of it, this is um, important. And what facilitates, what makes it possible to do that is <clears throat> precisely an attention to code and code in relation to ciphers. So a cipher in that sense is, a, is an alphabet in, a, in perhaps the most general sense that we know, a, a finite set of characters or of elements. So not just, so number concepts would be a, a, a ciphers in that sense as well. <clears throat> as, um, as a particular alphabet in a language. And then the taking into account of, of ignorance at the same time, no? so that we can never, we, we, we can never, we can never be sure. <clears throat> so this about um, quantum literacy, um, where <clears throat> translation is prior to having an original text and a duplicate no? or a reproduction of it as a translation. So, and this, I, in my understanding, um, let's say lives in this relation between uh, negative and positive entropy. So uh, I have another slide where I, where I will talk briefly how, how I came to terms with these two, two concepts. But there's a kind of an a priori of translation. So before being able to make a proposition or a statement, um, there is an a priori uh, of translating, of translating uh, even what one does not understand. So there's a, there would be an extremely interesting link to the argument uh, or many of, let's say, the, the fascinations perhaps that um, Rancière has with the ignorant schoolmaster. You know? So, but with there it's more, it's more about conveying, conveying uh, uh, skills and knowledge. Um, here it would be more radical, or it would be radical actually, not mainly social, but uh, radical with regards to knowledge. But I have not, 
I have not developed that. <clears throat> the key thought that negative entropy brings in has to do with, this, with a question which is quite scandalous. Um, can thought affect its object? No. I will, I will um, show you in a moment how, but I want to, to also recall in, uh, in Serre's part of his interest in, in the lighthouse as a, as a topos is precisely this. So it's the one text where uh, Serre is uh, quite explicit in, in granting um, that things are animated, that as even in, while thinking philosophically, uh, we don't need to kind of refuse science uh, and, and turn to animism or, or uh, no, any kind of this uh, agitative or polarized um, constellations in order to grant that um, if, if we attend to things in how time passes through them, how they age, and this, this kind of change there is a kind of, of, a, of, an, of an animateness um, at work, whether it is the one of the thing itself or the world or, 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 or life or history, um, be that as it may, but uh, this seems to be the case. So can we then ask, does a translation, can thought affect its object like a translation affects its original? It's a kind of a guiding question. Vera, can Not I just interrupt you briefly? Yes. Um, we'd just like one also like to have some time for questions. Um, what, do you think it would be possible for you um, like to finish in the next minutes or do you think you need a bit longer? Well, I can, I can finish in, let's say in five minutes. Yeah, five, five minutes is fine. Great, okay. thank you. <clears throat> so, again, this question of the intellectual growth with regard to translation of entropy. Um, Simone Weil is very interesting with regard to this. She um, has a very striking citation here. It's in response to, she's asking, well, if we don't want a particular dogma or a particular belief to fuel moral behavior, what could, how could we think of moral behavior? What, what could fuel it? Where could we find the energy for it? And she says, there is only one remedy for that, a chlorophyll confirming the faculty of feeding on light. Not to judge, all faults are the same. There is only one fault, incapacity to feed upon light. For where capacity to do this has been lost, all faults are possible. So what, here again, what I find interesting is this emphasis on photosynthesis, which has this kind of alchemical aspect, no? if, we, if we think about it. Um, so it's a kind of a transubstantiation, which happens, and yet it's a totally ordinary thing. And we can, um, we can, we can do it technically as well. So there's a, a physics <clears throat> that, that um, kind of triggers a qualitative change that is interesting. And this is, with regard, so I was looking at how the term negative entropy was introduced. <clears throat> and um, the background against which I think it should be read is a statement <clears throat> that is put here um, quite, quite um, plainly. Thought interferes with the probability of events and in the long run, therefore, with entropy. So this does not say thought affects its object directly. Yeah, that's important. It's, uh, my, my stance is always this code, coding as the, as the, uh, the, the convertible. It's not an interface, really. It's a, it, it does something. It's like money. It, trans, it transcribes. So thought interferes with the probability of events. No? This is too difficult to go into now, but there is a huge lack in differentiation between probabilistics, stochastics, and statistics. So if one would really think about those um, practices of, of uh, uh, engaging with, with, um, with, with extrapolations and predictions, um, it would be crucial to, to, to include time. How do they work and operate upon time? No? Do they, do they, uh, yeah, how do they operate upon time? Are they more concerned with a kind of a promise or with a retro projection? or with a kind of a, <clears throat> a, a, a stasis that is being produced. Um, 
so this is the background <clears throat> and wherever probability is cryptography and code is there no probability has to do with uh, alphabets <clears throat> with ciphers so with a finite with a finite amount of cases that can um, that one can can calculate with um, and <clears throat> The term negative entropy was introduced, if I'm not mistaken in this, by Erwin Schrödinger in What is Life? And in my understanding, but here I am maybe not enough in the disciplines um, themselves, but from my understanding, the interest was not primarily to kind of apply now a, a, a thermodynamic paradigm to, 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 to life, but um, it was, driven at least by asking new questions, no? Asking new questions. So what I was trying to talk about in the beginning with, with, uh, with Susan Langer. So not just how do we solve a problem that is already there, but what kind of questions can we ask with the new kinds of means that are available? So, so to grant that entropy may be what it may be, so not trying to define it, and then suggest it's negative inverse so to go this is a kind of a mechanical gesture a kind of a rhetorical or an inventive gesture and coin in a term of negative entropy uh, and then have a kind of a constellation that one can um, con yeah think with i think you know you know the story <laughs> what is interesting is how then these two sides because the negative and positive entropy they can be flipped with respect to foreground and background and the different information theories especially the mathematical one by shannon uh, contrasts with the one by wiener with the cybernetic as a universal science approach um, they they um, they arguably um, change the foreground background relation so whereas whereas the channel <clears throat> Can be can be considered as a kind of an organism. If you go to the cybernetic theory, the channel becomes an 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 an, an, uh, an entropic order, which is an any order in the mathematical theory. And of course, this has enormous impact on what we think uh, information does when we when we work with simulations and so on. So these kinds of thinking they are what abstractions do. No, so so uh, so whether we think is yeah a centimeter is a standard or a, a, a real <laughs> you know, kind of an absolute magnitude, um, it, it makes it makes uh, of course differences. Um, this role of code, how does not so much what is now the true notion of negative or of positive entropy, but how are they crafted these notions? No, how are they crafted if we study how um, its coding works? And with regard to this, Brilouillant's um, approach um, was, 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 was especially interesting because he explicitly foregrounds the role of code. This is something um, that is very rarely addressed in a, in a you know, code is a bit like transparency. No? So, so it, it's, 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 it's often, um, thought with but not thematized in how one thinks with it and this is uh, different in in, in Brilouillant. that was very important to come to terms with a lot of the ideas in there um what it allowed him to do this is actually the crucial point is to say well when we have code we have we we can have we, we it's not about does energy or thermodynamics explain information theory or information theory thermodynamics but we can have um, a prop um, we can have positive and negative entropy once regarding energy and once regarding information and the two are not commensurable directly so that that would be the concrete side where the translation of entropy would uh, would, would work with <clears throat> Good. Maybe to bring it back to the beginning, then. So this, how is this, how is this not primarily a, a technological approach or an understanding? Because this question of the agency, no, which in quantum literacy kind of features as a as a as a as a as a sort of a witness, um, we can also swap the point, the optics, 
and say, okay, it's not the, 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 the reason or not the reasoning or the rational agency, but um, this kind of exposure, it is, this, is, this is how it is facilitated and what, um, who experiments the body. No? So he said, it gets a very different understanding of the body. And the body, this would be my link to the, to the natural, not this one, to the natural um, philosophy approach. When we say bodies are not primarily species or individual, but there are natural bodies, um, which, which, which uh, affect how time passes. <laughs> yeah. But we can do uh, with, with such a, an understanding. Good. Yeah, I wanted to bring this to a form of poetics. I will skip this now. I just want to, to position it to you. So I, I, I don't want to say we need to reanimate uh, cosmology no, from antiquity, <laughs> but I do find it extremely intriguing to think again of, um, of, a, of a, an in-between uh, scope, let's say, um, that, is, that is not descriptive, but in, in, yeah, inventive and accommodative of ideas. And this uh, understanding of a meridian poetics by Paul Celan is going very far in such a direction. And what he does is like with positive and negative entropy, he begins to think about the poetics where you wouldn't be preoccupied with verses and with, and with stanzas and with meters, but rather with the doubling notion. So he works with gegen, Gegenworten is, is, is one of the key terms. So to counterword or to um, not just to picture, but to counter picture at the same time. And he, the, what he's asking is what happens if we, if we try to bring this further, if we try to, to, be, to become articulate in thinking in this way, no? so to be mechanic in a way, but then the, the mechanism is not the world as a machine, it's a, it's a thought, it's a body of thinking, it's an abstract um, a world in which and with which we can, um, we can figure things out quite literally. So then this, this, this relation to the body, which can experiment, and that's also the link to the canon, is that um, it, there, is, there, there comes to be uh, interesting, not just order and organization, but a kind of a figuration or a sculpturing uh, aspect, I would say, when we, when we start to really think about translations of entropy. So yeah, translations in a philosophical sense. Okay, I hope I made some kind of sense with the short ending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera, for this talk and the insights in, in your reading of Michel Serre and all the other authors um, included in your talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, we're a bit over time, but um, yeah, um, we will just like take uh, as long as we, we want and need for the discussion. Um, yeah. Does anyone have a question? Please just use the hand, the raise hand function. If not, um, people can think about, um, about possible questions. I'm just, maybe I'm just going to start as, um, as I'm also trying to uh, to get my head around Michel Serre at the moment, and what's probably important also to say um, for for those who don't know Michel Serre is that uh, the translation of entropy he is kind of performing in his thought is still conceivably different from um, from others um, of that generation, like. Uh, Jules Deleuze or Bernard Stiegler, who tried to think with entropy. There's like something systemically uh, different in uh, happening here, which might also push back towards a certain reservation that ha might have grown um, amongst analytical philosophers. Um, um, yeah, think, thinking why, why apply or why try to look at um, entropy in um, so different domains, such as to the lighthouse, uh, Virginia Woolf's novel. Um, but maybe um, I can start with my first question here. Um, 
because yeah, it's 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 difficult to understand what translation means in Michel Serre. And um, and I understood that you're trying to propose a sort of mathematical structuralism on the basis of multiplicity that takes code both as a key. And here I found it interesting also like from the metaphor perspective uh, earlier we've, we've heard of like the holy gray and here it's like rather the key. Um, the key which is not a structure itself, but kind of as well, um, it's a it's a structuralism of content. So like the key is not is not a given structure, but like um, entails a multiplicity of structures. This is like how I understood you. And I was wondering whether this is the case. This is a bit of a specific Michel Serre question, but whether this is the case in all of his writings, whether the like the code is really the key for his translations between um, thermodynamics and Briouin's understanding of information and um, the paintings of Turner and so on, or whether there is maybe a thermodynamic structuralism in the way James has invented it just today. That really, that takes, um, yeah, that, that takes, um, the understanding of entropy in this coupling of Jacques Monod, Briouin, like a kind of naturalist, thermodynamic, informational uh, understanding of, of entropy in like the very specific authors Michel Serre looks at, and then um, displaces, it, displaces it into, into art. Yeah. It's a bit difficult because the your circumscription <laughs> went too fast and was way too too detailed. I um, I would not subscribe to that. So it's not it's not a, that code is key in the same in the same sense. Like so, um, I mean the key is so there is there is something about when when you when we think about information not through a spatial understanding or a or a no. A, quantitative uh, uh, in the sense of a, of a kind of a semantic uh, understanding or a, a quantity but through these scales that are that are from harmonics now then then the, the the key has it has a lot to do with tempering a whole piece on the one hand but it also has something to do with um, um, uh, tuning with finding a tuning, no? so so then this notion of a key in the in the cryptographic sense, of, where you can unlock something, and then it's not that then you know the the hidden secret reveals itself, but this kind of of key has something to do with finding a tuning with things, and this finding the tuning is the link to the embodied way of um, of being exposed in order to translate entropy so the translating of entropies has something to do with finding such tunings mm -hmm. and these tunings have a lot to do with what in german we call their tact no so how we open so that it's a kind of a subconscious let's say um a skill almost that people have with things and with people but we can hardly uh, really explicate it it's something it's it's some, something embodied but something like learned, of course, and acquired to a large degree. So the, the notion of key works in, 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 in many ways. And it's, I think, part of, part of so in Michel Serre, it's always, he brings all these associations, everyone for them is on its own, is a precise one, but how they work unfolds from the interplay of the different pictures. No? So when you, it, and that's why I'm speaking of motifs. So it, it would not be key as code as key or something like that. It's their motifs and they reappear in different, in different um, language games, in different registers, in different um, contexts, the same motif appears. And it's from recognize, learning to recognize it in several things that one can find an understanding. And then one can start to, to look for, for it uh, with regards to the mathematical things that he describes. So they are not descriptive, they are, they are quite rigorous. Mm -hmm. so, so then a structure is not it's not a metaphor in in, in that sense no and mm -hmm. and and in the way that he deals with with uh, with structure is um it's not related to 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 i mean it involves a stance with regard to mathematics at large 
involves the stance with regard the question there is always how do you resolve algebra basically the quadrivium arts no harmonics arithmetics geometry and algebra so all of them make up mathematics but depending on which one of them we give primacy and modernity gave primacy to arithmetics romanticism gave primacy to algebra <laughs> yeah but but mathematics is changes with that mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you. I was very clarifying with like the, the distinction from what the key metaphor does here and what it doesn't. Um, that was that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll also give space to um, to other questions. Um, Joel, do you want to go first? Yes, yes, yes. So I don't want it to seem like I'm just asking loads and loads of questions, but um, <laughs> it's. Uh, th thank you, Vera. The, it was actually very nice to hear you quote from the the the, the Simone Dei. Uh, line and I, and I think my internet cut cut out so I wanted to just kind of ask you again how you interpreted that line in someone in someone they because I, I I have always kind of seen it as a meaning that the kind of humanity has the great misfortune of not being a plant in the sense that and all life life has the great misfortune of not being a plant in the sense that in order for and this maybe goes back to what we were talking about in relation to thermodynamics and life is that when uh, photosynthesis occurs I suppose from the sun, we're not directly increasing the entropy of the of the sun. We're not exhausting the sun, um, and I and I've always seen this as a kind of like a, a reference to the very beginning of, of Nietzsche's Zarathustra, and then in relation to to Bataille, this notion of the kind of the excess of the sun, um, and it's it's quite funny because there's a there's a kind of a, a German uh, Russian scientist called Vernadsky who also talks about this um, about the kind of misfortune of, of humans not being able to directly photosynthesize um, and, and, I, and I, can, I suppose well, the question is that I missed <laughs> what you were going to say about it so um, yeah how do you interpret that that part in in, in Simone Weil and the kind of a relationship to you know why why is it at fault that we're not plants yeah, I didn't read it at all like that. <laughs> so the passage where she where she develops this sentence, um, it it asks the question of so she she I mean she's clearly a mystic, no, and 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 this, it's a spiritual approach in which she thinks, but she does not want to 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 refer uh, in a in a legitimizing way to uh, any particular kind of belief. So the question that she there asks is. Then how is it? Uh, so where where if we want to think in a, even in a mathematical and in a in a natural in a physical way about let's say the the no, the difficulties that we face even the psychological ones, then then how could we think of where where can we find the energy to expend us in moral actions? Where could we find this from? And then she says, well, there's only one way how we could account for this. It's just like the chlorophyll with the plants feeds on light. Um, we need to we need to feed on we need to feed on on uh, on knowledge on light as well. No? So so the sun in my in my reading, this is not at all um, uh, going in a direction that would kind of have a, a system, an economic system of exhaustion. But it, there is a divine generosity for whale uh, with regard to the sun in my reading it's it's not always already a critical discourse with her i would say precisely not i think she is she is uh, she's leaving and that that's actually something which is similar to how descartes did it too she's interested in finding a discourse that is scientific and knows about its limits no and doesn't try to define that which it cannot account for that can find a, a confidence of itself that is honest and upright and so on, but within limits that are there. I mean, in Descartes, he wrote as a fable about the world for the same reason. He wanted to have a domain for science that could not be fought over by the by the by the by the, uh, by the religious wars. And Simone Weil is driven for. In my reading, that's how I relate to her from a very similar kind of ethics, I would say. So very different from Batay. Yeah, no general economy there. Yeah, yeah, very different from my reading, but thanks for it. It's very nice. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Tobias, yeah, please um, go ahead. Last question. So uh, I was interested in what you said at the beginning about this the difference of your talk with the, with the earlier talks today uh, and this sort of um you call it sort of the positivistic uh or 
I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what word to, to put, but I'm interested in the sense in which if you look at the methodology or the approach of someone like Michel Serre for more analytically minded people, uh, it seems that he's always playing with metaphor, whereas he will try oftentimes to insist that it's not metaphor. And when you said sort of this notion of tact and these sort of notions coming from music and harmonics, um, I was thinking about how one could sort of develop an argument tact is uh, something, the tact is something you can have in music, but it's also a pattern of um, how you interact with other people. And then you can talk about striking the right tone with someone and so forth. We can have these sort of endless uh, horizontal movements between disciplines and, and metaphorical movements and so on um, between discourses. My question is to return to the way you started your talk. What, how, is there a type of rigor that we can apply in these cases so that it's not just in a sense, um, free flow or just sort of um, automatic writing or, or something like that. And is there a different type of rigor, which is not an analytical rigor that can be applied in um, using these types of transfers and translations? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's mathematical rigor. No? But mathematical rigor, which doesn't, which doesn't, it's a, it, if you want, it has, it, it doesn't go from um, the theorem to a logical proof. Instead, it makes an artifact which demonstrates it. It makes an instrument, if you want. It makes it experienceable, but does not explain it. But from making it experienceable in a, in a, in a, in a, in a measured, in a, in a, in a moderate, if you want, in a moderate and in a moderated way. Um, it, it can it can keep present but it but it uh, but this this kind of what you were saying these associate these shifts these these graspings let's say that remain loose to a certain extent but also are very plain no and and um, in 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 my understanding and that's what I like so much about about uh, Ser's work is that he begins to think again about these kinds of experience which we all share apart from some discourses which try to tell us how we should speak about them <laughs> yeah so and and there is this again and again this emphasis that through relating mathematical rigor with with uh, rigor in this sense with a, with a, um, a sensory precision so does it feel right then in the experience um we can translate between uh, to all to all languages because we don't have an original language for it the original is the experience which we learn to articulate in a way that can be conveyed across uh, cultural cultural divides and, and language divides and so on. So that's the emphasis of the positivism and of the of the primacy of the mathematical of the of the scientific, but not in the sense of um, of, of of legitimating knowledge against each other or or of of building a kind of a hierarchy of um, uh, yeah of meta levels and so on. So there's a disparseness between these things. Thank you for for the answer and um, and um, all of your questions. Um, I think that was um, yeah that was a very good dialogue also. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, we'll we'll um, continue this workshop tomorrow, and I hope we can also continue some of the question. Um, yeah, thanks thanks uh, Vera again for for this um, really interesting talk and. Um, yeah, I'll, I hope I'll see you all tomorrow. Um, in the UK, we'll start at 10.30 and in Berlin, Vienna, Rome um, time um, at 11.30. Sorry for the confusions again. Yeah, I wish, um, I wish you all a very good evening and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.